This is The Oddball Show. Welcome to Season 7. The Oddball Show and the Oddball Foundation is dedicated to mental health advocacy through art. Um, so, Tor, uh, tell us, um, first of all, real quick, to my audience, um, Tor is uh, a American author, conservation biologist, uh, and Guggenheim Fellow. His latest book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, focusing on the effects of climate change on the natural world and the strange, fascinating way that plants and animals are adjusting, evolving, and sometimes dying out. It is a story of hope resilience and risk and a reminder of how unpredictable climate change is as it interacts with the messy lattice of life. Tor Hansen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. So let's do it. Let's do it. Tell uh, tell me a little bit about your book. Uh, what is it about to, to the listeners who might not know? Sure. Well, sometimes when I'm out talking about a new book and people ask me to summarize it, that can be kind of a long story. But with this book, I figured out early on that if I can just explain the title to people, uh, then they'll really get the gist of the book all in one shot. And so the title is Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid with a subtitle, The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. So if we start to break that down, um, we get into some really interesting stories about how plants and animals are responding to rapid change, to climate change, in their environment, and how we can go out and measure that in real time. So let's start with the, the plastic squid, if you will, which is a really fascinating story that comes to us from the uh, Gulf of California uh, down in Mexico where there traditionally has been a fishery on jumbo squid, the Humboldt squid, these really large squid in that area. Uh, you know, three, four, five, even sometimes six feet long, these squid. Until several years ago, after a series of climate-driven marine heat waves passed through, the squid fishery just dried up. No one could catch any squid. And everyone figured that, well, these squid must have just moved on. They must have shifted their range to cooler waters where they're comfortable. Many species are doing that in response to climate change. So everyone figured that was the story until a group of scientists went down there to see if there were any squid left. And in fact, when they started doing their research, they found there were just as many squid as ever. In some places, they were even more prolific. But instead of responding to that stress of the heat, the warm water, by departing, that had triggered in them a totally different life strategy. They were growing, uh, uh, maturing twice as fast, they were living half as long, they were eating different foods, they were reproducing in half the time as before. And under those constraints, their body size was just reaching a fraction of its former size. Adult squid that might have been five feet were now a foot long or less. Too small, in fact, to bite upon the hooks that the fishers had traditionally used to catch them. So the few that they were able to catch, they were throwing back thinking they were juveniles or another species altogether. The squid were almost unrecognizable. And it's a marvelous example of what biologists call plasticity. And this gives us the phrase, the plastic squid. It's a natural flexibility already built into the genetic makeup of an organism that allows them to respond quickly to change. And if there were an Olympics going on for plasticity in nature, creatures like the Humboldt squid would be on the metal podium for sure, because they've got it in droves. So go ahead. Yeah, so Tor, um, plasticity, right? Um, yeah. When we're talking plasticity, we're also, you know, there's, there's, I'm thinking of neuroplasticity, but how does that relate in neuroplasticity to like, like the plastic squid? Does that, is that something that at all relates plasticity versus neuroplasticity? It's, it's a different application of biology, but the root of the word is the same. And it comes to us from this idea early on, you know, we're, we're used to think of plastic now as all of the, uh, the technologies and, and uses that we have for this stuff. 
but the, the, the root of the word itself means to be flexible, to be flexible. And that gives you neuroplasticity. It also gives you this idea of inherent flexibility in nature. You may recall some of your listeners, the, uh, the old comic book character, Plastic Man, who could yes. stretch his body into any shape, you know, at the drop of a hat to take on criminals and save the world and so forth. I think we all wish that plants and animals in nature were all like Plastic Man right now, because it would give them a much better ability to respond to the rapid change happening all around them. That's cool. So that... That story gives us the plastic squid part of the title of the book. But what is really remarkable is that it's not just inherent uh, plastic changes that are occurring out in nature. We see a lot of those in terms of behavior, in terms of even body uh, responses that you see in the squid and so forth. Um, but we're also beginning to see signs of measurable evolution taking place in response to climate change. And that is the other half of the title, The Hurricane Lizards, which is another great story from field biology. And this time it comes to us from the Turks and Caicos Islands down in the Caribbean, where a scientist, a herpetologist named Colin Donahue was doing some research on a little species of a knoll lizard, which is is a small little lizard that's sort of a distant cousin to an iguana. So you can kind of picture what that looks like. And he had gone out and measured a whole population of these lizards on a couple of little islands as part of a study where they wanted to remove Norway rats, these non-native rats that were eating lizards and doing all sorts of other uh, harmful things to the native flora and fauna. And they were going to get rid of the rats. So the idea is you measure the native stuff, get rid of the rats, and then see how the native ecosystem responds. Well, he'd done his field work and he'd gone back home and then two category five hurricanes slammed across those islands back to back and leveled the place. And of course, the, the, the rat project was put on indefinite hold and uh, he realized he'd have to save those questions for another time. But he also realized that he was in a really unusual position that he could go back and rather than looking for the impacts of, of of the, the rats on the lizards, he could try to understand whether or not uh, the hurricanes had had any measurable effect upon the population of lizards that he just studied. He, in fact, started noticing differences immediately in the data from the lizards. The survivors of those hurricane events were the lizards with the largest toe pads and the strongest front legs and the shortest back legs. And he sort of had a theory that, you know, if you had big toe pads, which are sticky, that would help you uh, hang on during high wind. That sort of made sense. And the strong front legs for gripping. But what about these short back? It didn't make any sense to him at, at all. But luckily, he had planned ahead for this eventuality. And he had traveled back to the Caribbean with a leaf blower in his luggage. And he told me he had a, a, a good conversation with the, uh, the customs officer trying to explain the science behind traveling with this, you know, landscaping equipment. But he needed it because he wanted to know how lizards behaved in hurricane force winds. And since you can't stand there in the middle of a hurricane taking notes, he wanted to recreate a hurricane on the porch of his motel room. And he did so with this leaf blower. And I should say that no lizards were harmed. He had it set up so the lizards were safe, but he would place them on a stick that resembled the sort of twigs and so forth that they gripped in the wild, turn on the wind and film their behavior. And when he did so, he saw immediately why they had the short back legs, why they had the strong front legs and why they had those big toe pads. Because as the wind speed increased, their back legs would slip off first, leaving the lizards clinging by those strong front legs with the big toe pads, while their whole bodies were, you know, were flapping like flags in the wind. And those features gave them the ability to hang on longer because the short back legs reduce the drag upon their bodies. And so what he realized was that he had just witnessed survival of the fittest in action, a step in the evolution of these lizards driven by high powered hurricanes and taking place not over hundreds of years or thousands of years, but really within a single field season. 
Tor, I want like how how did how did how 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 are they holding on like that? What is with the 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 legs and how are they holding on to the uh, the leaf blower like that? What is what is uh? I'm watching the video right now. I don't know if you've seen this on Facebook. The video Live. is he, yeah. So in addition to getting a lot of hits on YouTube when he posted this thing, that video really does explain what's going on because you see how they're gripping with the front the front feet, and if you could picture a toe pad of one of these lizards, it's covered with these little tiny ridges that increase the surface area of those toes and give them incredible gripping power. This is the way that so many lizards are able to climb up walls. Some lizards can even run across the ceiling. They have incredible stickiness, if you will, built in to the structure of their toes. And so the ones that were able to hold on longest were the ones that survived. So Tor, um, now we're talking about those, the- Those the, traits the, don't, down. So yeah. mm -hmm. the, now the Humboldt squid is playing. We were talking about plasticity. What is happening here? We have this guy catching something on a boat. What was this about? So that is the Humboldt squid. Those are pictures of that research in action. And you can see how large those squid can get. And what was remarkable to the scientists was realizing that just from the increase in that water temperature, it had triggered this totally different life strategy for the squid. So you see that last picture, the squid was barely larger than the man's hand. <laughs> uh, and that was the same species that we'd seen in earlier pictures getting four or five, even six feet in length. And what seems to be going on is what, <laughs> it's an example of this plastic response, a, yeah. a, a natural built-in response that somehow, Yes, there's a small squid there and a large one on the left. You so, can see. Yeah, so one's those on the right, are, those one's are on the left, both, right. Those are both adults of the same species, but the small one is raised up in warm water. And it's as if sometime in the earliest phases of life for the squid, either in the egg or the larval phase, uh, there is a trigger, depending on the water temperature, that in a sense tells that squid, tells its genes, if you will, that conditions are harsh, that things are hot. It's going to be a tough place to make a living and you don't want to have to try to support a six foot body length. So it, it steers the development of the animal into a different, what a biologist would call a different phenotype. They have your genotype, the genes expressing a different uh, phenotype, a different expression of those genes to be smaller, to live a quick, fast life, eating different things to, and reproducing in half the time. So you can complete your whole life cycle in six months uh, and, and be successful with a different strategy. All right. oh, so, that, so this one was cool. Hold on. I want to talk about this next one about this bird here. Um, I, I read about this. This was like towards the end of the book. What's going on with, what are these birds called again? So those birds are called little ox or dove keys. There they are, beautiful little seabirds that live in the high Arctic. And I think we're all used to thinking of the impacts of climate change upon polar bears. But if you could look beyond the bear, uh, get the Bruin out of the way and look over the edge of the iceberg, you might catch a glimpse of one of these dove keys. They're little seabirds that live and forage uh, in the Arctic, and they specialize in hunting for plankton that, that thrive at the edge of the ice flows. And they breed on islands, as you see in this picture. This is Franz Josefland in the Russian Arctic. And the dovekeys breed on the islands, and then they have to fly to the edge of the ice to forage, to get food for their chicks, to bring all the way back to the nest and so forth. So that strategy worked great when there was a lot of sea ice in the Arctic. But as it is retreating farther and farther away from those breeding islands, the adults have farther and farther to fly to find food for their chicks. So they have always been predicted to be a, a casualty. They would be an early casualty, if you will, to the effects of climate change, because ultimately that distance would simply become too great. They would not be able to bring back enough food in a timely manner to raise chicks and the populations would crash. Wow. So this was the theory until a group of scientists actually went up to the high Arctic to Franz Josefland in Russia and visited one of these breeding colonies and fitted uh, little radio tags on several of the birds to see what they were up to 
And they had their predictions. They knew where the ice was they, and they knew how fast dove keys could fly. So they knew that they would have to be in the air for at least an hour to, uh, to reach the ice. So they were astounded when they downloaded the data for the first time and saw that, in fact, the dove key has been only been flying for four minutes. So they realized in that moment that their theories were wrong and that something else was happening, that somehow these dove keys had pivoted from their you know, lifelong traditional food source to something else. So they realized by looking around the island there, that another effect of climate change was in fact saving these dove keys because the same warming trend that was melting the sea ice and making it retreat from the islands was melting the glaciers on the islands and causing that glacial meltwater to flow like a river down these valleys into the fjords the cloudy blue sort of glacial water filling the fjords and then out to the near shore environment where it slammed into the cold, dark currents of the Arctic Ocean. And that transition zone for little creatures like plankton swimming from one type of water in the sea and hitting this wall of glacial water, it was like swimming full speed into a brick wall. It was stunning the plankton, killing some of them even. And the dove keys had learned they could feed right on their doorstep, just cleaning up all of this plankton that was being stunned in that transition. Uh, so in that instant, when they figured this out, the whole story of Dove Keys uh, changed from one of decline to one of resilience. Because over the course of their field season, then they were able to show that the Dove Keys weren't just surviving, they were thriving on this new diet. And based upon the amount of ice in those glaciers, even under current warming trends, that buys the Dove Keys a lot of time, at least a century, uh, in which they will hopefully find then additional ways to keep adapting to the rapid change going on around them. Wow. Yeah, it's very uplifting to see and hear how these species are evolving and able to survive and sustain. Um, but what about humans? Like, what do we need to do? Are we going to be among the casualties or are we going to be the ones that adapt to more serious climate change? Well, it's a great question, isn't it? And it is some, in some ways inspiring to see some of these stories from nature to remind us that, you know, nature is not a passive bystander to this sort of change, that species will do whatever they can to adapt. Some will make it, some will fail. And I think that can be inspiring to us in that we should be doing everything we can, too, about climate change, not only adapting, but taking advantage, really, of what sets us apart from all the other species on this planet in that we have the ability to alter the pace of this change by changing our own behaviors, by stopping or ameliorating the behaviors that are making the climate change in the first place, buying ourselves more time at the same time we buy all these other creatures more time. Now, in terms of, of our biology as a species, I think most experts would look at Homo sapiens and say that, in fact, this is a species that might get on the metal podium of the plasticity Olympics right there next to the squid, in that we have been able to live and thrive on uh, all continents at this point uh, and using our technologies to even uh, advance our plasticity further, thriving in different kinds of climate regimes. And so we have a great deal of built-in flexibility, but there are other things that are at risk, even though we may be a flexible animal. I think we've all experienced the fragility of many of the systems that we rely on and the supply chains that keep our, uh, our, our societies and our economies moving over the past two years from this global pandemic. We've seen that things can be fragile. And most climate change biologists would say we haven't seen anything yet because the stresses we are putting upon the environment through climate change will put great stress upon our systems. And so to maintain quality of life uh, is a different question than whether or not we will survive as a species. To maintain the, the way of life that we either are accustomed to or that we aspire to uh, in, this, uh, in this modern world uh, will require adaptation and will require reducing the speed at which climate change is taking place.
But would it be, wouldn't you find it difficult to get up on the podium for our species when there are so many poor marks from the non-scientific judges? <laughs> yes, if it was a, if it were a judge, uh, a judge competition, I think we wouldn't get good marks from, uh, from any other species at this but point. But uh, isn't our society very much a judging, you know, non-science, climate change is fake, everything that's even measurable to the human eye that is seen today? Um, we have a lot of judgment about that. And, and as a scientist yourself, Tor, does that frustrate you? Or I think it is frustrating. And one of the reasons that I chose to focus on current examples in the book was to try to get beyond the, you know, the, the controversy about causes and effects or beyond the uncertainty about predictions and really open all of our eyes to the changes that are taking place now, to what we can go out into our backyards as scientists or as lay people and observe in real time happening all over the place. The advancing dates of spring blooms and the effects that that has upon insects and birds and plants. The um, changing uh, ranges of thousands of species so that you can walk out into your yard and see birds that were not there when you were a kid. You can see these changes playing out in any environment, in a city park, you can see these things happening. So I, and that's one of the reasons that I decided specifically to focus upon um, current events rather than trying to relitigate uh, ideas about cause and effect, or rather than trying to prognosticate about what the future will bring. All right, I got a couple of questions for you. So one, you know, the Oddball Foundation is about is a 501c3 from environmental action as well as mental health advocacy. As well as social change, right? So three three things that's part of our mission. Um, I watched your Wired video. You said something about in, in evolution, the brain is getting bigger. Is that because people are getting either smarter or dumber? <laughs> yes, the human brain. Are we getting smarter? But it, it's a really interesting question. And the brain... If uh, you asked a you know a physiologist, they would tell you that brains are metabolically expensive, which means they use a huge amount of energy. Uh, oh, good! I'm, Tim's got the ruler. He's got the, he's got the ruler. Yeah, the, the brain is is changing, and so if you look back at the history of our species, and you may have seen this in a textbook at some point, or even in a cartoon for that matter, the story of human evolution has always been portrayed as a story of of brain size in that you see smaller skulls through time getting larger through the, the ancestral lineage until you reach the the, the capacious brains that we have uh, endowed, we have we are endowed with today. So it's the story of brain size, and each one of those transitions has always been associated with some change in calories, because if you want to fuel a larger brain, you need to be taking in more calories, right? Um, it's metabolically expensive. You are devoting twenty percent, perhaps, of your daily uh, energy to feed this this brain that's only two or three percent of your body weight. So it, it really does take more calories, more food, um, if you're going to get a bigger brain. And so each one of those steps in our evolution has been associated with things like, you know, the invention of tools for hunting or social behaviors for group hunting. There are people who look toward things like cooking that free up more calories from the same food. There are even theories out there now about how um, eating honey and learning to follow and raid uh, the nests of bees led to an increase in calories. So all of these different behaviors that would give us uh, the ability to support these large brains. None of that, however, tells us whether or not we are using our brains well. And I think there, that, that question is very much open to debate from any angle at this point, as we see the ways that in spite of how clever we are, we are fouling our own nest, so to speak, here on planet Earth. Well, when I get called out for eating that second donut, I'm just saying I'm feeding my brain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. Tor, I got to ask you a question. Uh, now, uh, yes. All right. So now uh, viewers were watching the Wired video that you, you became a part of as a biologist for Wired. Tell me, what is it like to, to answer all these questions about people's... Uh, questions about biology or i mean you have to know a lot you have to know a lot from a different a lot of angles right 
Yeah, that, you know, that was a, a, a definitely a, a fun way to spend an afternoon. And they asked me first to talk about uh, the book and climate change and so forth. And then sort of, you know, since you're in the studio, can we do this video with questions from Twitter? I said, oh, sure, be happy to do it. And so it really was just a rapid fire set of questions that they had gathered off of their feeds on Twitter. Uh, and it was a great hodgepodge of ideas. And so definitely a challenge, but really fun to try to find answers for people uh, that would, you know, spark their curiosity, hopefully, uh, give, uh, you know, in a sense, an answer and a question. I, I always think about answering things that way, you know, you give some amount of an answer, but also hopefully spark people's curiosity. So they're going to take that idea and go and learn more. I, I well, with it. electronics, with electronics and, uh, you know, all the technology we have today and short attention spans, is that changing our brains? It's a great question. It's, is it changing our brains? I, the answer is, I don't know. I'm sure there are people looking at that very question. It's certainly good evidence out there changing, you know, attention spans and how we think if there are physical changes to the brain, I don't know, but it's a marvelous question. There's your, there's your doctoral thesis uh, question for the day. If anyone listening needs, needs an idea, that would be a marvelous thing to look into. So what, what's your response to, I know that you hear a lot that, you know, it's, you know, in terms of climate change, it's too late. You know, there's nothing we can do about it at this point. Um, do you believe that? Well, I would say that is wrong. Not only a little bit wrong, but it's actually the opposite of the truth uh, in that we are the only ones who can do something about it. And so we need to, and anything we can do to slow the effects of climate change and limit the effects of climate change will be of great benefit to us and to the generations that follow. You, you can set aside all the biology you want and just focus on self-interest and it's gonna pay off in spades. What's true about what you said, though, is that there's a certain amount of climate change already baked in because of the carbon emissions that we have already unleashed into the atmosphere. They will be there for a long time. So we're already going to have a different climate going forward. But anything we can do to limit what goes into the atmosphere now in terms of methane and carbon dioxide and so on and so forth will pay off grandly to future generations. Well, you uh, basically, you present the solution. I think a lot of people know the solution. How do we get the big businesses and the profit makers to work toward that solution without affecting their bottom line? Like electric cars is the greatest idea in the world. We, they should all be electric right now. And we have the capability to do so. How do we prevent that uh, pushback? Sure. And that it will always be there. There are many vested interests in the status quo. So making large scale change in some ways really has to come from the bottom. And I was on a show recently with a reporter, who I think she was from the Washington Post, but who is very familiar with polling data and attitudes, public perceptions, social science, these sorts of things. And she brought up an interesting point. She said that there may be an upside if there can be an upside from the recent spate of extreme weather events that we have been experiencing here in the States, but all around the world, from the floods to the wildflowers, wildflowers, wildfires, to the heat waves, the hurricanes, so on, um, that suddenly people of all walks of life are being able to associate climate change with daily effects that are changing what they can do and how they can live. It's no longer that sort of, you know, polar bear on an iceberg threat, which is sad, but very distant from people's reality. Suddenly climate change is becoming more real. And she made the point that as that happens, we are in a much better position to see large scale change driven from the bottom I think there's a tendency for us to think we need to wait for uh, top-down change, you know, good leadership and better policy and so forth. But what those things will largely be the result of is the cultural shift that we need to make happen as individuals, because that's what changes the culture is the, you know, the, the behaviors, the ideas and the actions of its people. 
And so we're talking about then really a fundamental shift in our relationship to energy, not just how we produce it, but how much of it our lifestyles demand, how we use it. And that boils down to all sorts of daily activities, how we choose to drive or travel, how we choose to cut the grass or whether or not we hang the laundry, um, how we eat and how we vote and how we protest and all these things, these decisions that we make about our own lives um, can participate in something that biologists would probably term uh, positive feedback in that if you do something small like that, that's very much your, within your capacity to do on a daily basis, you know it's helped the climate a little bit and you feel better for having done it. And so you want to do more of things that make you feel better. And so lives tend to change in that way. And when that happens in mass, then we start demanding the policies that will get us the long run around this big crisis. So let me ask you a question, Tor. Um, as a, as a, the Audubon Foundation, the 501c3 for environmental action, what are some things that we can do today to start mitigating climate change? Oh, you know, it's it's all of these little daily tasks that we're capable of. I there was a there's a wonderful biologist named Gordon Orions who's in his 90s now and has studied everything from blackbird behavior to the evolution of fear. He's just a brilliant, brilliant man. And that the question, that very question was put to him, you know, what should a citizen be doing in terms of climate change? And he just immediately said, everything you can. And what is important about the way he phrased it is that choice of the word can, because what you can do varies. That's a very, it's a great word, it's a great verb to use in that setting, in that context, because you can do things in your daily life that impact your carbon footprint. So do them. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is very, it might be different from what you can do where you're living or right. in your position in life. People in a position of making policy have the ability to do, they can do things that I can't do as a citizen. So if everyone starts focusing on what's possible for them to do, and as we mentioned earlier, feeling good about the changes you can make, those things coalesce into a really powerful movement. So, it, uh, so such as you. sorry, Tor. Uh, sorry, Tim. So, Tor, is this a, is this a policy change kind of thing? Like you have to kind of get mobilized and get people involved, or there are already some. You know, we like to talk on the Oddball Show about nonprofits that are already doing the work. You know that that yes. you know the, the 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 guest is actually you know um, supportive of or passionate about. Um, what are some some of the uh, the some of the environmental action agencies that we can not agencies or nonprofits that we can get involved with today? I know one that I love personally is Surfrider Foundation. I've been very passionate about them for a long time. What is what are some some agencies we can get involved with or some nonprofits that people can look up? There are a whole suite of them. Really, what's interesting is you, you know this is such an overarching problem and we see it in biology ecosystems everywhere being impacted and so you see climate change now as a part of the response for a whole range of environmental organizations from the world wildlife fund that has a, a, a broad approach to the nature conservancy which conserves land and now thinking about climate change and connectivity among habitat types and and you know elevational gradients and all these things we weren't even talking about in decades past to groups Groups like the Xerces Society that focuses on insects, which are being heavily impacted by climate change, to the Surfrider Foundation, which you've pointed out. I mean, almost any group you can think of that, that may fit uh, a particular interest of yours, whether it's you know the African Wildlife Foundation or you know a group that focuses more locally in your area, they will have people working on climate change right now because it's that far-reaching and it's that important climate change is uh, it is it's not too much of an exaggeration let me put it this way to say that every biologist in the world is studying climate change some of them just don't know it yet mm -hmm. okay. how do you get uh all these groups mobilized to get somebody in a position of power i um, say you know Someone like you, Tor, runs for president and wins. How do we do that in terms of saving the environment? Tor for president. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. My my uh, here's my camp, my stump speech. Um, <laughs> what I would say is this, and I think we tend to. It's it's very easy to be discouraged because you have this this massive problem and you see repeatedly the attempts to address it at a large scale failing in some fashion, not getting there. We know we're not doing enough. We can, we can do the math. It's very easy to see we're not doing enough yet. Um, and what I would point out is that very recently, you know, we had legislation going through the house of representatives here in the States and got to the Senate that included the, the, biggest uh, group of policies to address climate change that we've ever seen, um, which would have gotten us a lot closer to, to where we need to be. And of course, it didn't pass. But what's important to remember is that it was only two votes short of passing. And 20 years ago, if we'd gotten anything of that size, even considered in Congress, it would have been a miracle and it never would have passed. You know, it would have been scores of votes shy of passing. So what I I try to remind myself, and I think it's important for all of us to keep in mind, is that we have made progress. And very recently, we were two votes shy of major climate change les- legislation. So I think the more we can do to you know, make this a priority in our own lives and the way we vote and the way we talk about these things, the way we behave, uh, the more it's a movement, the the closer we're going to get to finally getting across that large scale policy finish line that we've been waiting for for decades. Well, I have I I, I toward um, I have a question for you. Um, how what do we uh, do about? I have this feeling that people don't care about climate change because there's not rapid hurricanes sorry there's not rapid hurricanes and tornadoes and everything all happening all at once that it's like cataclysmic you know what i mean like it, like that it's chaotic and that it happens in your neighborhood and all of a sudden i think when something happens i i, I don't know a lot of people deny climate change and d- deny climate um can you explain that a little bit what is the phenomenon about out of sight out of mind why do people not care about it until it's too late i don't understand what is that Isn't it frustrating? But there's a really interesting book that addresses this. There's a fellow named George Marshall, who has been a career climate change campaigner, you know, really working on policy for year after year after year and tearing his hair out because he knew the science and he could see what was happening and just couldn't believe that he couldn't make this urgent issue heard at the high levels where he was working. So he took a break from it and started doing research for a book and they had this wonderful title for the book. It, it's, it came out about, I don't know, five or six years ago, maybe. It's called Don't Even Think About It. And what he did was start talking to, you know, social scientists and psychologists about how people think. And why is this climate change problem so hard for people to act upon? This is a threat that is arguably the greatest threat we've faced, really. Um, And yet people won't take action. How is that possible? It's the same question you just asked. And what he was learned and put together from all of these interviews and and the, the studies that he did, you know, is that people are extremely good at responding to immediate threats. And they, they, things that are, that are actual, they're happening in the moment. You know, if a rhinoceros is charging at us, we know what to do. If it's a spear thrust, we can do it. If it's some crisis in the, the everyday, right in your face, people are remarkably adept, agile thinkers. They come together as groups. All of these things happen really quickly. But abstract threats that are distant or in the future, um, are are very vulnerable to you know what what someone might call cognitive dissonance. You know it's happening. You know it's severe, but it's not in your reality, in your face, in the moment. And so it's very easy to put off the action. That's exactly There's what it is. Yeah, a fabulous example, even from my own backyard, which sort of combines some of these ideas. But we had massive rains here in the Pacific Northwest, where I live, uh, a couple of months back, 
uh, really, you know, colossal flooding in various places. And there was a, a wash, a road washed out, a bridge washed out, not far from, from where I live. And it stranded, you know, a community on the other side of the bridge, right? So here we had this climate driven event that produced an immediate impact in this community. And there was this, this, this gorge dug through the road. Um, the water was streaming so fast, it was not even safe to, to wade across it for days. Yet the community, regardless of whether or not they believed in climate change or their politics or what have you, they rallied in just rapid fashion to build a footbridge across this chasm. And people on the, uh, the town side of the bridge this is a rural area, so the people on the far side were totally cut off from every service you can imagine, from you know gas and food and uh, post office. All everything was on one side, right? So you know people immediately got together. They figured out, well, fell some logs, we'll build a bridge. They had a footbridge across. The people on the the town side loaned extra cars and and parked a big bunch of cars there with the keys in them and said, you know, for the stranded people, you just walk across, you take one of our cars and go to town, do your shopping. And and the the solution was there in a matter of hours. And I I was just so struck by that because it seemed like George Marshall's book all playing out within you know this one instance when climate change becomes real people deal with it beautifully and and so i think we're really struggling now and maybe you're on the cusp in some cases with all of this extreme weather of climate change finally becoming real to people if we can do that i think we'll see some incredible solutions great stuff agreed so I have uh, one question for you. Uh, t- uh, Tim, do you have a question? Um, I mean, I, I definitely, I, I love that last answer because it's also, you know, there's this phenomenon of small sample size. Like it's not in my sample right now. And uh, the other part of it is, and how often do you hear this, you know, in July in Massachusetts here, you get that one day that's like 55 degrees and people are like, what, what, what about global warming? What about global warming? Like, yeah. I'm, today. I'm cold right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm cold right now. We fall, <laughs> we fall into this, we fall into this like uh, narrative of, you know, it's the guy with the leaky roof narrative. That, you know, it, it's raining and his wife is like, or his family is like, you know, fix that roof, fix that roof. We're getting wet. And he's like, I can't fix the roof. It's raining right now. And then when it's a <laughs> sunny day, he's like, well, why fix it? You know, no rain's coming in now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's exactly it, Tor. And that's, that's the thing. Like, we are, I mean, I guess I'll close off with saying like this. We are a f- we are affected by this huge crisis that is not in our face right now. So we're not addressing it. And I think that's, that's the truth of the matter. Um, let me ask, uh, I, I, my first show that I ever went on was at one o'clock in the morning on Saturday. And it was, uh, the, I don't know show with, uh, with a, a guy named CCR Shogger, who's a poet and amazing guy. And I, I like to do this at the end of the show. I like to ask, uh, the, the, I like to really ask the uh, the guest, what is one thing that you will you would like to leave for the children of tomorrow? And I would like to know your your what would you like to leave for the children of tomorrow? What is what is the hope that we have for the children of tomorrow? Because right now, you know, it's twenty twenty two. Things are not totally desolate, but kind of desolate, kind of like here and there. Is there hope? And what is like one thing you would, what's one message for the children of tomorrow? I, I would like to leave to the children of tomorrow bees. And by that, I mean the whole suite of bee diversity that we see on this planet, the pollinators, not just the honeybees, but the bumblebees and the mason bees and the leafcutter bees and the little ones you never even see or think about like carpenter bees or cuckoo bees. And I, and I say bees with a specific purpose in mind. They are everywhere. They are essential to how we live. You know, they pollinate crops and they're essential in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, they're very vulnerable to the way that we live, right? They're vulnerable to all the habitat loss. They're vulnerable to climate change. They're vulnerable to pesticides and, and so on and so forth. So I see, you know, see bees as 
a wonderful way for us to focus our energy if we're looking for a particular group of creatures out there that need our help. And that if we can be successful in leaving bees to future generations, we will be leaving them a much better planet because to have those bees, we will have taken a lot of steps that make life easier for everyone. All right. Well, here we are. And this is, if you want to know more about Tor Hansen and his stuff, just go to torhansen.net. And this is his web pages, a whole bunch of information and links to his TV and film and his events and also um, his books. And earlier he did talk about hurricane lizards and plastic squid. So that's what it looks like and pick it up at a fine independent bookstore uh, near you. Uh, can we just real quick, because I was messing around with the thing there. This is uh, Tor Hansen's website. It's Hurricane. Uh, the book is um, Hurricane Lizard and Plastic Squid. It's available. Where can we get it, Tor? I know you're all over the place. Where can we get it currently? Oh, I would echo Tim's comment and say if you have a, a favorite local independent bookstore, that's a wonderful place to, to shop. Of course, it's online everywhere as well. Well, you know, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I mean, we're uh, we've been messing around with uh, we you know we've been doing Oddball show now for seven seasons. It's our seventh season, mm -hmm. trying to get creative with it. So, uh, in the video, I don't know if you, I mean, it'll be different on the podcast. But if you were watching on the video, you got to see some me fumbling around with some videos, some some cool backdrops and stuff. So, if you uh, like what we do at Oddball Show and have guests like Tor Hansen. Please check out um, Oddball Foundation. Check out the Oddball Show. Check out Tor Hansen. Check out Tim Gager. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show, uh, Tor. Any uh, any closing words? No, just thanks to to you and to Tim uh, for your time and to all of your listeners. It was a pleasure being on. You know, it's this it's a uh, Oddball Show. <laughs> wrong one. It's uh it's the thing is. The thing about that I want to impart to the audience is that it's about uh, it's about time that we start to make a change, and that change only will happen with us. So honestly, if we want to make a change, it's only going to happen with us. We're the only people who can do it. So you know, it's it's been a pleasure having um, Tor on the show. It's been a pleasure having uh, Tim Gager on the show, and. You know, till then, um, it's been the Oddball Show. It's been real, and we'll see you all uh, real soon. Make sure to dedicate uh, some time to reading Tor Hansen on uh, – you can see him all over on the YouTubes. Uh, uh, Tor, um, if, if someone wants to see you next, where are you going to be? Oh, my. What's the next thing coming up? Um, I just had the book come out in the U.K., so I'm doing a lot of – uh, of publicity uh, for them right now. So you would probably focus on, you know, things like the guardian and uh, times of London and that sort of venue for the next couple of weeks. Well, fantastic. Thank you for being on the show tour. It's been real. Um, and everybody, thank you, Tim Gager for being on the show. Uh, it's, uh, it's been real. It's been the oddball foundation. Uh, presenting the oddball show this is the oddball it's a 501 c3 season seven it's season seven oddball foundation is dedicated and to that's who we are we're the oddball art. foundation so till then we'll see y'all real soon thanks for being on the show tour it's a it's been a pleasure take care you guys thanks thank you see ya Thank you for listening to The Oddball Show with Jason Wright. And special thanks to co-host Timothy Gager and guest Tor Hansen. Make sure to check out Tor Hansen's book, Hurricane Lizard and Plastic Squid. Here's a few things going on with The Oddball Foundation. Congratulations to Nathan Lim, the winner of the first annual Just Another Chapbook Contest. Look out for his winning title, Echo Park, at the next Oddball Magazine publishing title. Congratulations, Nathan. A special thank you to Northeastern Savings Bank for including us in their 7th annual voting community campaign. Check out Northeastern Savings Bank and learn more about the campaign at northeasternsavingsbank.com. And remember by choosing local, you're making a difference with the Northeastern Savings Bank.
If you haven't already, check out our YouTube channel. And if you like this podcast, please leave a review. Your reviews help us grow and helps us to achieve our advocacy through Airwaves' mission. That's all from us here at Oddball Foundation. I'm Michael Berker, and this has been The Oddball Show. The Oddball Show is produced by Oddball Foundation, a 501c3 built for better mental health advocacy through art.